<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Victoria County Municipal Council. I would like to uh, acknowledge um, and acknowledge that we are, uh, this meeting is being held in Unamagi, one of seven traditional districts of Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq, uh, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I would like to call this meeting to order. Um, I'm, you've all been presented with an agenda. I'm wondering if there are any additions to the agenda at this time. If not, I would like an approval of the agenda. Moved by Larry Daphne. Second. Seconded by Paul McNeil. Okay, so the first item on the agenda uh, is the election of warden. This election is by the councillors present for the position uh, uh, for the position of warden for a two year term. Any councillor is eligible for the office of warden and the selection is by secret ballot. Should the council members be unable to agree on the choice of warden, then I shall determine the warden from the two leading candidates by lot as provided by the Municipal Elections Act, which means we pull it from a hat. I now declare the floor open for nominations. Are there any nominations for warden? I nominate uh, Councillor Bruce Morrison. Bruce Morrison. I Are second. There... You a second? I second that. Are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? Last call for further nominations. Uh, can I now have a motion for nominations to cease? Motion for nominations to cease. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now declare Bruce J. Morrison elected as warden for the municipality of the County of Victoria. And I would now ask him to come forward and take the oath of office for the position of warden. Uh, as the warden, okay, so you have to do the oath. I, Bruce Morrison, do swear or solemnly affirm that I will be faithful, bear true allegiance to His Majesty. Um, his heirs and successors, according to law. And I'm duly qualified as required by law for the office of warden in the municipality of Victoria County. And, and I'm sorry, that should be King Charles, that we made a change on that, right? And I will true, uh, truly, faithfully, and partially execute the duties of the office to which I've been elected to the best of my knowledge and ability. And I have not received and will not receive any payment or reward or prom promise thereof for the exercise of any partiality or undue execution of the duties of my office. Sworn by me or by you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So as the warden's first official duty, I would now turn the meeting over to the warden for the election of the deputy warden also for a two year term. And now they care declare the floor open for nominations. Any nominations for? Deputy Warden. I nominate Larry Daphne. To the position. Moved by Councillor McNeil. We have a seconder. I'll second. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Oregon. Any other nominations? Any other further nominations? Any further nominations? We have a nomination to uh, cease. The nomination cease, please. All right. Thank you. It's moved by Councillor McLeod. Nomination mm -hmm. cease. Do we have a seconder, please? Second by Councilor Longba, all in favor? Contrary minus, motion's carried. And I now declare 
Larry Daphne elected as warden, deputy warden for the ministry. <laughs> Sorry. Turn the page. Uh, as, uh, I would ask you now to come forward and take the oath to King Charles. I, Larry Daphne, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles the Second. King Charles, I guess, uh, his heirs and successors according to law, and that I am duly qualified to require by law for the office of deputy warden of the municipality of the county of Victoria. And I will truly, faithfully, and partially execute the duties to, of the office to which I have been elected to the best of my knowledge and ability, and that I have not received and will not receive any payment or reward or promise thereof for the exercise of any partiality or other undue execution of the duties of my office. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Yes, yep. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Council, for uh, providing us the opportunity to another term of uh, warden and deputy warden. And I will acknowledge the last two years have been difficult particularly with COVID, particularly with uh, hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been a challenge. And uh, so we look forward to the next two years. And uh, thank you on behalf of the Deputy Ward and I for your support last term and for this term as well. So thank you for that. So we, uh, we've made a slight change in the, uh, the uh, agenda. We're gonna move uh, Terry up because Terry's traveled in. If that's okay with Jen, I guess it is. Thank you, Jen, we appreciate that. No. So we're gonna turn it over to um, Terry Smith from Destination Cape Breton, and he's gonna uh, give us an update on the marketing levity. So, so over to you, Terry. If the, red, if the green There we go. <laughs> Well, thank you all. It's great to be here uh, again. And um, I just want to let you know, I'm going to speak about the Cape Breton <laughs> Island marketing levy, but uh, we just had a change that happened last week and, and I'll address that as well. But I thought it would still be of value to go go through and uh, and uh, give you this update. Um, so we, we had been uh, looking at a proposed amendment and I'll, I'll uh, walk through that. A little bit of background, the marketing levy. So it was legislated by the province in 2011 uh, and then implemented by municipal bylaws in each of our five municipalities on the island. The bylaws are pretty much identical except for just changing the name of the municipality. Um, right now there's a 2% rate that's charged on fixed roof accommodation stays at properties with 10 rooms or more. Uh, longer term stays of 30 days or more um, medical stays, students in dorms are all exempt from the levy. And uh, the act currently states that funds must be used to promote Cape Breton Island as a tourism destination. Around the time of the act passing and the bylaws being put in place, uh, there was an MOU established mm -hmm. with uh, all five municipalities that designated Destination Cape Breton to be the official agency to promote the island. So since that time, um, operators, well, those, those who are applicable to collect the levy have been collecting. They remit the levy funds to their respective municipality. They, uh, the municipalities then in turn provide those funds to us and we use them to promote the island. Um, in terms of the promotion of the island, um, I wanted to give you uh, just a, a little bit of uh, a look at some of the, the results that we've seen from the levy. So most of what we do these days from a marketing standpoint is, is all digital and it's driving traffic to our website. And um, this chart shows it, a lot of contrast there, but the first three years we were marketing to the Maritimes only. And uh, as you can see, there's a, a modest increase uh, every year. In 2015, we uh, started marketing to Ontario and Quebec, 2016 Northeast US. Um, and uh, you can see that the, the, the incline really took off when we started uh, going to those markets. And I should just say that for the first three years, the levy um, was fairly new, the budget wasn't substantial. So 
the strategic decision was made to uh, concentrate just on the Maritimes for, for the, uh, that term. But then as the levy grew, we were able to uh, expand it. Um, so that's in terms of marketing results, but converting to visits, uh, how does it, how, how have we done in that, in that time period? So um, from 2012, again, 2012 to 2014, you can see the first three years um, in terms of visitation to Cape Breton Highlands National Park. I should say the Cabot Trail is the number one motivator of travel, not only to Cape Breton Island, but to Nova Scotia. Uh, but as the number one motivator, we, we know that many of our visitors will be going around the Cabot Trail, the vast majority actually. So, uh, so most of those visitors are going um, uh, to purchase an admission at the Cape Breton Highlands National Park. So it is a, a good indicator for us. So this chart shows you the green line is Ontario, the darker blue line is Nova Scotia, the lighter blue line is Quebec. And it just takes a look at those three key markets. There are three largest markets. Um, and as you can see, the first three years, we see a modest increase, but we were focusing on the Maritimes only. Uh, and then again, 2015, we're marketing to Ontario, Quebec again. We start seeing strong growth there. Um, and um, I left out 2017 on this. That was the Canada 150 year where, where there was free admission to the national park. So it, it really skews the numbers and a lot of that wouldn't be attributed to the levy. So, so it, uh, yeah, it, it paints a different picture, but, but you can see that um, the, the growth really continued uh, uh, to the point where in 2019, um, the visitation to the national park from those three key markets was roughly double where it was in 2012. We also look at room nights sold. And this, uh, this chart shows the green bars are licensed room nights sold uh, in Cape Breton. Again, first three years, we're marketing in the Maritimes, modest increases. 2015, uh, a little bit more of an increase. Uh, 2016 takes a really uh, good jump. Uh, and then again, higher in 2017. Um, when you look at 2018 and 19, in terms of licensed room nights sold, it looks like there's a decline there. But if you look at the blue bar down the bottom, blue bars, that's a shared economy or mainly Airbnbs. And every year they've been rising in terms of their share of the accommodations market. So if you combined those with the licensed room nights sold, we would have seen increases in those, those uh, years as well. So over that period, um, if we compare our growth, incremental room nights sold over the 2011 baseline, uh, it more than doubled the province overall. So uh, that's a strong testament to, uh, to having the levy in place. And we estimate that uh, the levy has a return on investment of $27 in visitor spending for every dollar that is collected. However, so our, our current situation, uh, our COA funding, um, back when the levy was formed, there was an agreement that uh, with Enterprise Cape Breton where they would match the levy revenues to, and provide that to Destination Cape Breton. Um, that happened a couple of years and then they said, oh, we've got to cap it at $640,000 a year, which they did and it stayed that way. Um, ECBC uh, is closed. Uh, the, their contracts are taken over by ECOA. Um, prior to them being closed, uh, we, we had a, a new three-year agreement. Uh, so ECOA honored that three-year agreement. Um, but then they signaled to us in 2019 that, um, that this was an, a, an agreement that, that no other destination in Atlantic Canada receives and we're going to have to reduce your funding to be more in line with what they receive. But we're going to do it gradually, so it's not as painful, although $100,000 a year in cuts is, uh, is for our organization, uh, does have some, some challenges for sure. Um, so it's, it's reduced this year, it's 440,000. Last year it was 540. Uh, next year it will, will be lower again, and then they said it will level off at 300,000 a year. Um, so that's one challenge. Uh, as I showed you in the previous chart with the room nights sold, um, Airbnb and v Verbo rentals 
Uh, they grew through, from uh, a standpoint where there were 7% of registered room nights sold in 2017, where last year they were 30%. And by and large, they don't collect any, any levy. Um, there's a there's few exceptions, but uh, they, they would be very small numbers. Um, so those factors, and then of course, the last two years, we had the pandemic. So uh, I, I didn't include any of those numbers because it really uh, kind of uh, paints a different picture. Um, so we knew in 2019 that our co-funding was going to be reduced. Um, there were some uh, steps taken, and this actually, uh, the first one started before 2019, but we used to have an office that we were actually renting from the federal government. Um, when that lease was up, uh, that office was closed. We moved into the former Visitor Information Center building uh, in Sydney River to cut costs. Um, we reduced staff, so in 2019, we had 11 full-time. Uh, we have nine currently, and I have two on parental leave right now, so, uh, so it's even more challenging this year. Um, and we took some steps to achieve organizational efficiencies, really using technology as, as best as possible uh, to, uh, to work smarter. And, um, and as I showed you the, the results, um, and by the way, this year, we're closing in on 1.3 million uh, website sessions, which is last year, we, it was a record, and we're blowing last year out of the water already. So, um, so it's, it's continuing to go, go very well, the marketing program. Um, so we're delivering strong marketing results just despite the shrinking budget. So next year, our budget for marketing uh, would, it looking like it would be about 20% lower than it would have been pre-pandemic. So eventually we've done all we think we can cut in, in terms of the operational side of things. Uh, eventually we start looking at cutting the marketing budget, as I mentioned. Uh, and although we're getting good results, um, it's going to come to a point where, where there's gonna be a, a real challenge. So the marketing levy helped us have basically a decade of growth um, but, uh, but if we don't do something about this, about this, we're headed for a cliff. So uh, the board of Destination Cape Breton um, elected to uh, do a revenue stream report. We hired a, a consultancy that works with organizations like ours across, across the country. And um, they took a look at our revenue streams, looked at what are some of the best practices with other organizations, and they basically recommended that we increase the marketing levy rate. Um, and just a line from the recommendation, even without the current income stream challenge faced by Destination Cape Breton, there's a multitude of benchmark evidence to suggest that the current 2% levy places the region at a competitive dis disadvantage to many of its competitor destinations. And here's what they mean by that. So in this map, it shows levy rates uh, across Atlantic Canada so we're at 2% right now, Halifax is at 2%. Uh, in PEI, Charlottetown and Summerside of levies, they're both at 3%. In New Brunswick, Moncton, St. John, Fredericton are all at 3.5%. Uh, in Newfoundland, there's a small one in Gross Morne, that's 3%. And the highest in the region is St. John's Newfoundland at 4%. And in 2019, the average levy rate in Canada was 3.43%. So we're not only the lowest in the region, we're amongst the, uh, the lowest in the country. And we compete against all those other jurisdictions. So um, we, we took that, that recommendation and, uh, and went out to operators and uh, accommodation operators and did some consultations around the island uh, back in the spring. Um, and that included operators who currently collect the levy and some that are smaller and don't currently collect it. So we provided them with uh, three options, uh, increasing the levy rate to 3%. Um, Halifax has also taken steps to move to that uh, 3% rate. Um, we estimate that this would add about 450,000 to our budget. So it should replace what we're losing from ACOA, but it doesn't address that, you know, Airbnb and, and Verbo are getting a higher share of the percentage. So, um, so it still could be in jeopardy. Um, 
And then the second option was apply the levy to all fixed roof operators. Uh, so remove the 10 rooms or more threshold. And there's a question of fairness. You know, we have some communities where um, there's, there's one accommodation operator that is charging the levy and across the street, there's another that, that doesn't have to. So, so there's, there's a, a question of fairness there. They all benefit from the destination marketing that, that, uh, that happens as a result of the levy. Um, we estimate this, and, and uh, this would apply to Airbnb too, um, that we, we would get somewhere between 250 to 350,000 uh, per year added to our budget. Um, so it might replace what we're losing with ACOA, but you could argue that it also leaves money on the table if everywhere else in Atlantic Canada is 3% or higher. And then we asked them about combination of one or two. So the feedback, the vast majority of operators supported going to 3% to increase the levy rate to 3%, but they were adamant that uh, all fixed roof accommodations should collect, including Airbnb and verbal properties. And, um, and even uh, many of the smaller operators that don't currently collect, they were saying, you know, we have no problem uh, we, we see the benefits and it's only fair. So it was great to see that. Um, so they, they did say, you know, all the, all the costs are rising these days for, for people. So, so, and some operators said we've already quoted 2023 rates to groups and things like that. So don't do this right away. Let's look at January uh, 1st, 2024 as a start date. Um, a couple operators said, uh, you know, it'd be great to have some flexibility um, so that you can work on other issues other than marketing, like the workforce shortage, which we're, we're already doing. Um, but um, but uh, they just said having the levy state that it is only for promotion of the destination might be a little limiting. And, um, and also it was mentioned at pretty much every session that uh, Airbnb and Verbo must be more regulated to ensure a level playing field uh, and quality for guests and suggested that we start the process now. That's a separate issue, but uh, um, something that, you know, was, uh, was very common at these sessions. So based on that, we were looking at doing a proposed amendment um, and um, had, uh, you're the fourth of five municipalities on the island that we presented to and talked about this. Uh, I've also talked, talked to almost all of the MLAs uh, who regardless of party stripe were all in favor of, of the uh, of making a proposed amendment. And, um, and so we were going down the road of starting that process. And then the province, uh, and they, they started this back under the previous government before the pandemic, they were looking at because um, us at Halifax, we have the levies where we're 2%. Yarmouth had a small one where it's a $2 per night charge. Um, then Digby approached the province looking to put a levy in place. Uh, Lunenburg County was looking at one. Pictou County was looking at one. And they said, well, why do we have all these separate pieces of legislation? Why don't we look at what New Brunswick did and put rules in place, one piece of legislation that governs levies uh, across the province. So um, we started hearing just back in the spring that they were thinking about doing this again, but we didn't know what the timeline was going to be for that. Well, they just in introduced the legislation last, uh, last week. Um, so we were, we were uh, pretty happy to hear that, that uh, they were moving forward with that. The good news with that legislation is it's, it's very closely aligned to what we were going to recommend as well as Halifax. Um, and um, so they're basically saying that it would be a percentage-based system um, and up to a maximum of 3%. So, um, uh, and they, we were going to recommend that they give municipalities the power to make future rate changes. Well, they've basically said, you can set the rate, but to a maximum of 3% is what they're proposing. Um, we, we were going to, recommend removing that 10 rooms or more threshold and adopting the Tourist Accommodation Registration Act definition of fixed roof accommodations, which would then apply to Airbnb and Verbo properties. Um, they didn't address that 
they basically said, we'll leave that to the municipalities and they can establish those terms in their bylaws. Um, and we're going to uh, mention amending the funding to use destination marketing as well as destination, uh, destination management as well as marketing um, for the uses of the funds. Um, we're not clear on where that landed. So, so um, we have to see a little bit, a draft of the legislation to see that. And then the start date of January 1st, 2024, they basically said, as soon as the municipality establishes, once this passes the, at the, the legislation, they said, as soon as a municipality um, passes uh, a bylaw um, for this, that, um, that it could go into effect then. So it could happen sooner, but in respect of what we heard from operators, we are going to recommend that we stick with that January 1st, 2024 date. So um, my request to council would be um, that, uh, and, and we can come back and, and, uh, and, and address this. Um, it, it would be wise for the five municipalities to again adopt a, a consistent um, uh, levy bylaw for, for all five. So uh, that's, that's one thing that I think we have to look at, but um, my request though would be that you, you would um, support moving forward with what we had proposed, um, the 3% levy and then removing the 10 rooms or more threshold, adopting the Tourist Accommodation Registration Act definition of fixed roof accommodations. So um, those two things um, in the future bylaw would be, uh, would be fantastic to have included, but uh, I think for consistency, we really need all five municipalities to be on the same page with this. Good. Thank you, Terry. We're gonna open it up to questions if you don't mind. Um, Councilor McNeil, any questions or comments in regards? Thanks, Warden, and thanks, Terry, for the presentation. Um, I'm just wondering with the Airbnb in Virgo, did did uh, Destination uh, Cape Breton put out a survey to to the operators, asking them uh, what they think about the uh, an increase or a levy to towards them? Airbnb that? specifically. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have all of their contact information, so we can't do that. Um, some of them that would be registered with the province, we would have reached. Um, so no, um, and um, we we did put out uh, an, another opportunity based on the feedback we received. We went out to accommodation operators and said, "Here's a report on the summary of of what uh, what." operators told us in all of these meetings, here's what we're proposing and gave them a final option to, to like uh, submit any, any further feedback to us. Um, we only had three submissions. So, so and it was pretty much aligned with what, what we were uh, recommending. So, so I think the accommodation operators that showed up at our sessions were, uh, they, they seem fairly united on, on, in terms of the direction, but, uh, but no, in terms of Airbnb, um, I can tell you that this is, uh, um, I, they are benefiting from the destination oh. marketing that we do for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they, they, I, I think the, the sense from the operators, it was, uh, the other operators that are, that are currently collecting, um, is that they're feeling that they're getting more of, of the business they're seeing it. Yep. So they they should be contributing to this as well so that's i think a pretty common sentiment no i, to yeah. I totally agree but uh, we're seeing an uh up, up in, in the airbnbs around especially around district one and down through uh cape breton county down in shenanigan and, and uh, uh big beach area too so i was just wondering yeah what effects that would have on, on them so okay so that's uh, that, uh, and I think um, based on the feedback from the operators that there needs to be uh, better regulation. That's something that uh, that I think uh, at some point we'll talk to the municipality, see if there's an appetite for doing that. That we we think that would be uh, very beneficial in moving forward. Thank you. I've had some anecdotal discussions with 
people that I know that have uh, Airbnbs, and they basically said we have no problem collecting. So. Thank you, Councillor McNeil, Deputy Warden. Yes, uh, thanks, Terry. Excellent presentation, as always, and uh, totally agree with your presentation. Uh, I believe going up to 3% makes a lot of sense. Uh, we're definitely the top island in North America, so we maybe we should be the highest. But anyway, 3% I'm quite happy with. Still disappointed with the province. Uh, back last year, they said by the spring of 2022, they'd come out with new regulations for short-term rentals, and this is the first I heard of them doing anything on it. So it's uh, kind of disappointed that they didn't make the decision to remove the 10 room threshold instead of putting it back on the municipalities. Um, but uh, I, I was contacted by CBC this week to talk about short-term rentals just off, uh, off base on it. And uh, they said on their uh, research that there was 400 and some Airbnbs in Victoria County operating at this time and only 200 and some are registered. So it's uh, it's definitely grown. And uh, I know we in our area, we've seen it grown a lot, but, uh, and I, I agree that they are uh, getting the benefits of the marketing also. So I'd love to see it uh, go that way. But uh, once again, thanks very much for your presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Councilor McLeod. Uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, great information. Uh, no questions are on this time. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Patterson. Thank you, Terry. Just a question, maybe I missed it. Your proposed amendment, uh, eliminating the uh, 10 room and so on. Do you have a figure of how much extra that would uh, bring in in revenue? Yeah, with, with the the two, it's probably six to seven hundred thousand. Okay, so it gets, yeah. it replaces what we're losing from, but, but also yeah uh, allows some for growth yeah. as well. Uh, on the Airbnb question, uh, I spoke to a couple of operators <laughs> in my community, and they have no problem with it. Uh, would the average be somewhere around a hundred dollars for an Airbnb? Or some more expensive. I know some of them are eighty-five, and you know some of them are more expensive than that. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah it would really range. Yeah, it, it ranges but but anyway, it. it's it's not a huge amount of money, uh, four or five dollars at the maximum, probably on each night to stay if you gave it to or charged them or whatever. And, and you know, I think I myself, and I think most people, you go on vacation. You're not going to quibble over five dollars. I mean, what's the, what's the difference? I don't think. So the operators would pass it on to the the customers, and that's that's the way it should operate. I guess. It's it's the visitors. Yeah. The other yeah exactly. The other part is though the uh, delinquent operators. Do we have any notion of how much is not coming to the municipality? I guess, and then not going to you. And if we do have that amount, or some, do we have any way of enforcing it or gently nudging them to pay their bill or whatever. Well, um, we, we've started and Leanne would be aware of this. We, we've got a pilot project that we're, we're just starting and it was something that we, we were going to start before the pandemic happened. And then we, we put it on hold because uh, the last thing operators needed was to be pestered about the levy during the pandemic. But now that we're getting beyond that, um, We've, we've started a process, we call it a, an education, levy education uh, program, where it will be um, monitoring the collection and, and sending reminders to operators to get their payment in and that sort of thing. Um, it, it's uh, in terms of anyone delinquent, uh, like all that that program would do would be like going back to the municipality and, and providing the information. It's up, it's up to the municipality to, uh, to do any, any kind of enforcement work with, uh, with operators. Joe, for every dollar, there's $27 of, of uh, recovery or spin off, whatever you want to call it. I mean, that, tell an operator that they should say, they should get the wallet out, right? Because they should be paying, because they're benefiting from that. You yeah, know, their business is benefiting. If, if they're collecting it, then it, it's it's just like if they were collecting um, HST, it, it's it's yeah. in trust for what what they, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Harry, for the, the great uh, numbers there of people coming to our, our beautiful island. So now maybe you can share your numbers with Public Works so they can get the Cabot Trail paved and ditched. <laughs> Would be great. Public Works, are you listening? Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks for the information. 
Councillor Councillor Longva. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the great presentation and for coming. Um, yeah, so I have a business on the trail, as you know, and the last two years, your your marketing is doing very well because it's the busiest in 28 years. The last two years have been the busiest. Really? Yeah, after COVID, by big time. Like it's amazing. I've seen like roadblocks on the on the Cabot Trail, like on the lookoffs. Like I've never seen that many people, uh, like as there is. I mean, this year it was a little different because of that hurricane uh, scared people and they didn't come um, as much. But still, I had a fantastic fall up from other years. Um, but when you go to other provinces, um, you see like these pull off rest spots with washrooms, with garbage uh, cans. So all the operators in my area anyway are um, having people dropping off the garbage when they put locks on their boxes, then they just pile the garbage on top of the boxes. And now they've started dumping it off of Smoky at the look off there. It's uh, really bad the amount of garbage that's coming. So I just wonder with this money or if destination Cape Breton, because you promote the island and uh, the province promotes the island, it's the biggest draw is the Cabot Trail. If they could um, lobby the government for more money um, to put into that, to help out with, uh, with washrooms and with uh, garbage cans. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I know there's a program for washrooms that you guys have been working on. I'm not sure where that that stands, but um, that that's desperately needed. Um, just so you know, in our 2030 strategy, one of the recommendations talks about um, treating the Cabot Trail as a premier experience. It's not just another provincial road; it's it's our number one motivator of travel to the island. So. I had sent uh, an email to Keith Bain uh, recently and, uh, and uh, raised um, some tar and gravel kind of ceiling that they were doing. Yeah. I think that was on the North Shore. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and the response back from Public Works was that's, that's an acceptable method of protecting the pavement. And, um, and what I said to Keith was when it comes to the Cabot Trail, it, acceptable is not good enough. It's got to be the absolute best. Like that. That's uh, like it's not just another road. It's it's a tourist draw, and you know uh, I could go on about roads. But uh, anyway, I, I know that uh, you know the public works has had uh, difficult challenges with storms over the last few years. Uh, but uh, but you know I think that. We, we definitely have to reinforce whether it's garbage, whether it's road conditions. Uh, the message has to be getting through to uh, the provincial government that the Cabin Trail needs to be uh, treated as the, the amazing, um, you know, draw that it is. Yeah. yeah. The chip and seal remedy broke almost every windshield on the North Shore and North and our development officer can tell about her new car what happened to it on a trip to Inganish after that that happened I mean they did clean it up but now there's no markings on the road it's like and it's been raining so it's like black and dark and you can't see and what what will happen because they I live in Marion Bridge and on, on my highway they did that about seven or eight years ago and um, because it's it's basically it's tire traffic that that uh, that flattens it, and you end up when it's raining that you've got grooves in the road that collect all the rain and make it hazard to drive on. So anyway, that should never happen with the cabotage. Yes, we have grooves now too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks, Terry. A little bit off track from the levee, but but yes, we're all passionate about that one. I think we're allowed to vent. Yeah. Council. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know Cao has a question for you, Terry. Yeah, and just one other one. I think we're gonna rename our public works department because we are not paving the roads at this point. So uh, we yeah. may have to remarket our public works department. Um, just a question, when this goes through, uh, just looking on the administration side, I'm assuming that it would be Airbnb that would be collecting the levy and remitting it to us? 
So that will be the ideal situation. Uh, there are some hoops that you have to jump through. So I, I've been talking to um, uh, Charlottetown about that because they, they're a little bit ahead of us. Uh, they removed, they just like us, they had a 10 rooms or more threshold and removed it a couple of years ago. And they're now going through the process of getting uh, a, a, a short-term rentals bylaw passed. Um, what they were told by Airbnb is we want, we want, we want to see that you've got what they say, a modern short-term rentals uh, bylaw because Airbnb feels like their brand is tarnished when, um, you, know, you know, there, there are issues being caused as a result of too many Airbnbs or whatever might be the case. So, um, so there are many jurisdictions uh, around, around the world, but uh, primarily in Canada, in Ontario, there's, there's probably, uh, there's about a dozen jurisdictions that um, they have it set up with Airbnb, where Airbnb does the collecting and remits it. That's, that's where we need to get to. Uh, that solves any kind of enforcement on those operators. So, um, and, and it's a, an administrative help for them as well. So, so we'll, we'll aim to get there as soon as we can. A comment from me, Terry, and you've heard me speak to this before. It's about the uh, collection of delinquent accounts under the new bylaws. Is there a way to address that? I, I mean, we're there, there's no uh, gain for us to collect the tax. It costs us money to pay staff to collect it, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I just don't see it as being our responsibility to to go after delinquent accounts. Is there any any bylaws out there that deal with that? That's something we can look into. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a question of discussion. I really yeah. do. I mean, the operators are collecting from the customer. They're remitting it here. And if, if, if they don't pay it, then yeah. it's an issue. So anyway, and I don't I think it's our responsibility to go back chasing people for that money. We didn't collect it. So why should we have to go back and try to get reimbursed. So anyway, I'll leave that with you if you would look into it. So um, I think you had two recommendations today that would be in agreement of raising the, uh, be in agreement of raising the levy, uh, marketing levy from two to 3% and that uh, this would be in, um, there'd be no restriction on or of 10 or more. It would be right from one room up. Am yeah, I what, what I'd suggest though is, um, is that, Council can deal with that at a later, like a, a new bylaw is going to have to be drafted, yep. and um, um, and so you you can deal with that at that time. You you don't have to do a motion for this. This at this point is is for information. Okay, yeah. so I would assume it will be a some type of standard bylaw if we're trying to get all the municipalities on the same page. So I believe, I think you might be trying to say possibly that we're in agreement with what your amended proposals are there. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted them specifically to those two, but it's to an amended generic bylaw. Right. Okay. So when we would need a motion to that effect. Would we accept the two recommendations as presented by Destination Cape Breton? So it's moved by the deputy warden, seconded, seconded. by yeah. Councillor Longval. All in favor? Contrary minded. Question, and warden. I'll back to what Terry said earlier about the province possibly uh, enacting legislation to cover it across the province. So would it then be not just a Cape Breton bylaw, but a, a kind of a province-wide bylaw? But I guess we could do what we did today and then fit that in if they, we have to there, yeah. The legislation will state that each municipality will have to have a bylaw. You gotta state that, okay, yep. Okay, you're clear on that now, Councillor. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Contrary minded? Motion's carried. Thank you very much for your presentation today, Thank sir. Thank you very much. All right. So our next presentation, we welcome Jen Ripley from Victoria County Home Support Services, and she has a short presentation she's going to take us through. Welcome, Jen. We'll just give you a few minutes to get set up. That's my understanding, yeah. 
How are you? Council, I do promise it will be short. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with everyone today on this balmy summer day. Um, I'd like to first start off by thanking you for the support you've given so far to Victoria County Home Support Services and our Meals Plus program. So my objective today is just to give you a quick update uh, about our program, but more importantly, I'd like to share some information on an opportunity that has come to our um, to the forefront through the establishment of, uh, of our program. So just as a, I guess, a quick refresher about what is Meals Plus, um, it's a program that's currently only offered to home care clients, and it's to home care clients that receive meal preparation services. <laughs> Our program is in its second year, and right now we're basically just solidifying the relationships that we've been building with local grocers uh, and with our volunteers. So the program itself is a bi-weekly delivery. We deliver every other Thursday. Uh, basically, it's a curated grocery package of fresh items. So you're always going to see a, a protein, a fresh fruit or veg, a grain, and uh, by popular demand, uh, a homemade sweet. <laughs> Uh, we deliver those through a network of staff, volunteers, grocers, and Victoria County Transit. And then those groceries are prepared in the home um, by a continuing care assistant. So what we've seen so far over the last year and a half is really positive results. We're seeing happy clients, we're seeing happy staff. Um, we are, there's discussions about the importance of nutrition on healthy aging. Um, and it's really providing this preventative lens to healthcare and to nutrition. Uh, the home delivery has been a good aspect. Uh, participation is being tracked through our database. And overall in talking with clients, we're seeing an increased quality of life that they're experiencing. So just to give you an idea of the logistics that go into one of our single visits on a delivery day, in terms of budget, we spend $30 per person per order. Right now, we have 22 clients that receive the Meals Plus program. Each week, that involves seven volunteers or businesses, because I'd like to give a, a, a hats off to our grocers uh, at uh, Central Co-op in St. Margaret's Village and the Cabot Trail Food Market, who do the deliveries themselves. Uh, currently, we're in eight communities across seven districts, and we work with partnerships with five different grocers. So... The biggest opportunity that we've seen that's come to light for us is we've observed that there's a need for Meals Plus beyond home care, that a proactive approach to healthy aging uh, is needed and that nutrition plays a really key part in this. To this end, what we've been thinking about is that there could be a benefit to a community branch, a community program of Meals Plus. So if this was ever something that council wished to explore, a municipal Meals Plus program for community members, Victoria County Home Support Services offers the use of our existing infrastructure and our staffing to implement this on your behalf. So what would that look like? So some general ideas on what this could look like for you is if you wanted to start with a four month trial. There's some proposed dates there, but um, with some of our other pilots, we found being representative across all the districts is a great approach, but ultimately, if it was a municipal program, it would be yours to decide, and you would also decide your own eligibility factors. Based on our current capacity, probably the pilot could only be for about 12 older adults that are not currently clients. That will help us build up a, a capacity and additional volunteers. With the inclusion of community members, you might wanna look at a pickup option as well, instead of always focusing on home delivery. Because these would be community members, it would be the curated grocery list, same as what we're already doing. And we could maybe include a recipe card similar to HelloFresh or any of these other item uh, businesses that are out there, but it wouldn't include the meal preparation as that's a part of, of home care. From a budget perspective for you, that would be for those 12 people, about $2,880 for the four month pilot. If you found that that was something um, that was effective for you um, and that through evaluation, which we'd be happy to assist with because we do evaluations through our own volunteers and different surveys of stakeholders, you could expand uh, up to about 50 community members. Um, again, adding that pickup option 
would be a key component if that was something that you were interested in. And to give council an idea, if you did an annual budget for 50 people of food only, it would be about 39,000. So I'm probably on one of these minority groups that doesn't actually have a request for you. <laughs> I have no request, but this is just something that has come to our attention as a need for Victoria County. And if this is something council would like to pursue, Victoria County Home Support Services is here to support you do that. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, some of us um, had the uh, the opportunity to uh, see the presentation before, and it kind of spurred our interest about potentially being a, a partner, or at least have come to council and see if there is interest on council or prep from council to see if they want to participate in this particular program. So, with that, I just want to open it up to uh, some questions and perhaps start with uh, you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you, Warden. Thank you for your work, uh, Jen, because I think this is an issue that's been discussed for a long time. And, and uh, you know, we're finally uh, seeing a path clear, I guess, to take some action on it. Interestingly enough, uh, at our cooking class in Bulletry yesterday, uh, we had a discussion about this very topic. And we are looking at possibly modifying our model where people come to the cooking class of us or a group doing the cooking and sending the meals out to uh, individuals, which is a departure from what we've been doing. Um, there, there's funding available uh, through the New Horizons grants, which I believe are due December October 30th. 1st. November 1st, I'm sorry. November 1st, Jennifer, mm -hmm. that's right. So if anybody wants to look at that, or there's a group in their district that wants to look at that, that's an option. Uh, through the Department of Seniors in Nova Scotia, I'm sure there's some opportunities there for funding. Uh, councilors have district budgets, which maybe, <laughs> anyway, you know, if we wanted to start a pilot project in our own uh, area or whatever. So again, I think this is kind of spurring us on to uh, take some action, which will uh, benefit our, our seniors. And uh, thank you very much for leading the way in this. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Oregon. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, is it only for seniors or do you do uh, disabled people too? Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right, Council Organ. It's for home care clients. So whoever's been authorized to receive home care by continuing care and if they receive meal preparation. Those are our current eligibility requirements. Uh, you said you had 22 clients right at the moment? Uh, yes. How many more could you possibly add? Like, is it a a huge number that we would want to build capacity first before growing but i see lots of potential for growth so we have found the number uh, fluctuates between 20 and 25 comfortably as clients come in and out of care but if we were to look at growth we would for example uh, it would be an investment into volunteer recruitment and looking at i think the pickup option would help so um, there's various things to look at i think to determine how quickly we could grow but there's there's room for growth Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming sure. and for your presentation. Um, so the twenty, the number 22, is that all across Victoria County? It is actually, uh, if you'd like a breakdown, we have uh, uh, St. Margaret's Village, uh, Dingwall, South Harbor, Inganish Beach, Rec Cove, North River, Bullardry, Ross Ferry, uh, and Bedeck and Big Bedeck currently served. Okay, and how, how did you arrive at 22 clients? What's the uh, eligibility criteria to arrive at that number? It's open to all of our home care clients who receive meal preparation. Okay. So, and that number is determined by the authorization of continuing care, who they deem as requiring that assistance. Mm -hmm. But if a, a, a municipal or not even municipal, a community branch were to be open for anyone who is not a home care client, that's where we see need as well for people who are not currently home care clients. So we just wanted to share that that uh, is a need. Yeah, and I, I think that like nutrition, it has to start in the school in grade primary. Like at, when I've been to the cafeteria in years gone by, like it's French fries and, you know, this kind of like in the cafeteria, which I just think if you're trying to promote uh, healthy eating, that it should be in the cafeteria too at schools and not like really unhealthy choices. And I love Fraser's idea. 
the cooking classes and then uh yeah giving mm -hmm. meals to the mm -hmm. seniors yeah perfect anyway thank you mm -hmm. thank you um did you have a question before i we're just going to work our way around jen just so you know yes oh i do so um so who would make these meals for you noted for volunteers so are we getting the volunteers or is no if if a community program wanted the assistance of home support we would use all of our infrastructure to help support that so it, it would not include though the meal preparation done by cca so this would be for a target group that's maybe older adults uh, but still fairly independent and wanting to take a proactive approach to their nutrition and maybe stay ensuring that they're getting those fresh ingredients ensuring that they're maybe getting a bit of stimulation and education on how to prepare them so it would be for a different demographic than home care entirely Councilor mcleod thank you jen for the presentation uh, so with the 2800 dollars they're asking you that will be for new 12 uh, clients, right? Correct. And uh, we need clients either and just for they don't use a home support right now. That's Correct. It will be like a pilot. Correct. Okay. Uh, no, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think it's the need of some seniors, um, you know, they're isolating and they don't feel like they want to eat or go to the groceries and, you know, having that pushing ill healthy, I think is a, a great uh, value. And of course, with the support of you guys, they, you know what they're doing, right? So um, yeah, no, it's, it's excellent, thanks. Thank you. Deputy Ward. Uh, thanks, Jen, for the presentation. It's great to see that this is actually happening and it's going on, I've heard a little bit about it, but uh, uh, it'd be great to add more people to it. I'm just going from my mind here, thinking of residents in my district that I know would really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure there's lots that would. Um, again, it comes down to the volunteers. I'm just trying to think of a group that would be, have the time to do it. The biggest thing right now is I find volunteers are getting uh, burnt out and the same ones over and over. But uh, I'm sure uh, we could probably find some people to, to take it on. And, and you're right. And I apologize. I should have understood. I think that's what the CAO was asking as well. And I missed, I missed that. We would use our volunteers. And I agree with you. And what we found is by sticking with a biweekly delivery, we're able to only ask of once every one or two months one oh, afternoon okay. of an individual. Exactly. So we, I completely agree. We Our ratio is no more, uh, our, our average ratio is one volunteer to three deliveries in their neighborhood. So great. I completely yeah. agree with you. Uh, yeah. Taking care of our volunteers is crucial. Yeah, definitely. So, definitely. Yeah. But no, great program. And I, I can really see some use for it. And like I say, I, I know a number of residents would uh, would love to see it. So uh, thanks very much for bringing it to our attention. Appreciate it. Councilor McNeil. In your list of communities that uh, I, I didn't see any towards the Iona area, like, is that because people opted out of the program or they didn't want want to participate in it or correct we were serving uh your district for a time and we currently have no clients in our care that are receiving the program okay. but as soon as there would be absolutely we would restart it's, that in, in your there area. is that possibility absolutely. that they can join at yeah. any time okay no thank you a couple of quick questions if i could uh, just more of a comment so there's no financial threshold if this was opened there there's you wouldn't have to be a minimum amount of income in the house uh, that we, if you do, were to do a community program, that would be up to council to decide. Okay, which is good to, because I'm thinking, and we had this conversation that, you know, the demographic is probably an older single individual that's that's at home, and it's a way of providing healthy food. And even though at thirty dollars per person, that might serve two or three meals for that individual. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it from a cost perspective, it's it's it's. Uh, um, and one meal is not $30. It could be $15 or $10, just depending on how many meals they get out and how many people that they are serving. The other thing that I would just want to mention very quickly. So if we were interested, who, who would we, who would you talk to and with the municipality or the municipality as council have an interest in taking a look at this particular program? We'd be looking at adding, I think, you had mentioned as a pilot project, 12 people across the municipality, four months, it would cost $2,800. And the benefits would be to 
anybody in Victoria County who wants to access the program. Mm -hmm. But just so we're clear, I think you're just coming forward with your success story of how it's worked for you guys. Correct. And you're bringing this idea to here. Correct. Where this could be a cost, but we'd run it. Okay. So yes. somebody here yeah. would run it. And we could facilitate that if you needed the infrastructure, right. you could provide the funding and we would just implement it for you more in a collaborative spirit because I feel our mission and mandate is in line with the municipality in, in supporting our residents. So it would just be a, a, a support, an offer of support. And then you're correct, the numbers are just to give council an idea of if you decided to do it, that was what it would be if you followed our model. Right. But there's absolutely no obligation. Right. Thank you. Or, what might I suggest, though, that we try to encourage community groups to to kind of take the lead on this, because for a couple of reasons, uh, you know, I don't know if we need the, the extra work that would have to be done here as the council or administration. And secondly, those groups know their community. They know that Mary down the road, you know, would probably appreciate this or whatever. And the other thing, Jen, the $30 that the warden just mentioned, are the clients charged that? They are not. It They're is not, fully no. subsidized. Yes, fully subsidized. Mm, okay. Correct. And that's what your attention, I'm sure, would be too for any uh, other programs that might start that they would be, like I said earlier, through uh, applications for grants or whatever, wherever the money can be found. Correct. Yeah. And, I, and I love your approach, Councillor, that there's many different ways this could happen. I think just uh, as, a, as a municipality, as, a, as our communities, if we're just aware that this is a need and there's, there's ways to make it happen. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, any other questions or comments? We're gonna take your presentation under advisement and uh, we'll have discussion later and, and we're not gonna make a decision today, but we'll just get a chance to digest the information that you provided today. And if we decide to follow up, we'll be in touch. Absolutely happy to support any, any other way. Great, sure. Nope, not at all. Our funding is secure at least through till uh, spring of 2023, and we'll be continuing on maintaining our own program. So we'll be here if you ever need us. We're here. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're going to move on to the uh, minutes of April 4th council session. Those minutes have been circulated to you. Were there any errors or omissions in the minutes of council session for October 4th, 2022? We should have referenced this morning, uh, this afternoon that Councillor McDonald is away today and he has sent his regrets well in advance of the council session. So with that, October 4th, those minutes, uh, if there are no errors or omissions, we have a motion to accept the minutes as circulated, please. Thank you. That motion. Thank you, Councillor Longo, seconded by. Uh, second. Deputy Warden, Daphne, all in favor? Contrary minded, the motion is carried, the minutes are approved. We're gonna move on now to the CAO's report, please, Leanne. Yes, thank you. Um, so as noted in the minutes, I wasn't at the last meeting, but I, uh, listened on the live stream. And so I just have a few things just to come from that and from the meeting prior to that. Um, so council had a meeting with NSHA, uh, last week, last Thursday, uh, I'm sure, uh, it will be brought up in probably the warden's, um, district concerns or his report back. Uh, we have a meeting set up on October 27th on the North Shore to discuss to discuss a potential washroom uh, idea collaboration in that area. Um, we have sent some UARB responses in for the water rate study, and we have also sent a request off to the UARB to have approval for smart meters and for water tank replacement in Dingwall, two projects that uh, are much needed um, within the water utility and they have to be approved by the UARB before they can be included in the rates. Um, we are trying to schedule a meeting for mayors and wardens, mayors and wardens island-wide. And um, actually there's a meeting going on today 
uh, with a few of the municipalities around um, the county administrative staff uh, discussing some uh, potential island-wide shared services. Uh, just another note that we are in a project of end-of-life fishing gear and there's free drop-off for uh, end-of-life fishing gear until the end of March at both of our uh, sites. Um, there was a question related to road signs and there's been lots of discussion on road signs, uh, who puts them up, who pays for them. Um, I think we need to talk about what council wants to do on that. Uh, we did some research and it's kind of 50-50 on both things on who puts them up and who pays for them. Some municipalities around the province uh, have the residents who are on that those roads pay for the signs. Uh, some it is the council that pays for it. Others also take the sign, give it to the residents on that road and have them put it up. Um, some rely on TIR Public Works to put the sign up and some ask their own Public Works staff to put it up. So I'm just looking for possibly some thoughts on where you're at related to that. Private roads, yes, private roads. Yeah, when there's a name change on the roads or anything like that. Um, so currently council has paid for the sign to be put up and I think it's been differing on on who puts the sign up. Um, does council have any preferences of how it's done? If it is the residents that put the sign up purchased by the county or I guess there's two parts to this question. Do you want the county to continue paying for those private signs on those roads? Um, and then the second part of that, once the sign has been purchased, does council want to request TIR to put the sign up? Uh, do they want the residents on that private road to put the sign up or do they want our staff to put that sign up? So I think, I think for consistency, we, we should have maybe we should pay for them because, you know, just so they're consistent throughout the, throughout the county. And uh, because if residents are required to put it up, we really have no control, you know, the size of the sign. And the so are you talking things. paying for the sign? I, I think we should pay for the signs, yeah. So yeah, you have been paying for the signs yeah. to and this And then I think the Department of Transportation should put them up though too. Because so, they know the proper height and all that, yep. you know, all the requirements for them. Yep, so. That's what, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, so now council's, council's discussion could come in here on this and we come up with a, based on that, we can come up with a policy of how it works. Yeah, because I think that when they, you want to put a sign, if you go with the TR, they have to, you have to, you have to apply, you have to spill something to TR have to authorize if it is okay, right? Correct. Yes, and that's to have the name changed. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, because I remember we put some of the children's playing, mm -hmm. and he will need to know exactly where we were, and they have to say yes or no. That's the last yeah. decision they have. The last decision, uh, but they don't uh, install the the signs. They won't. They won't. Okay. Yeah. So it have to be either. And also note, wait, if you're requiring the public works, um, the Provincial Public Works to put that up, it's going to take a while. Yeah, but they don't, and this was saying they don't. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 And starts to get Councilor McNeil, comments? Yeah, just one more comment. Like with the with the erection of the sign, like we provide the sign, but we also provide the four by four posts because I've been asked by a number of residents about sign, well, like we gave to the sign, but how are they gonna put, put it up? So uh, would, we, would we supply those four by four posts for them? 
This so, is it. This is private road, right? Yeah, it's private. Private yeah, road. it's a private road. So, yeah. so I, I think the other just item I would add to that, if I could, is that it's not like we're overwhelmed with name changes and signs. So we're probably at most buying five or six signs a year at most. So it's not like, I don't think it's a cost issue. So I think we can provide the sign. If it's a private road, I, I think it should be the responsibility of the individuals to put them up. And, and if they have to find out how far they, as Councilor McLeod says, if there's limitations or regulations where they can, that, that's their responsibility. We're just providing the sign and the post, I guess, and then they can install and they take the liability for it because it is a private road. We're not gonna take liability for the installation of signs and private roads. I would agree with, you. go ahead. Yeah, I agree, I think we should buy the sign and as far as the residents, if it's a private road, they install it themselves. But I don't even think we should provide the post because depending on, the, how do you know which is the right size yeah. post? That, you know, it could get very expensive and it's really yeah. wide open. I think uh, our part is providing the sign. Provide the sign. 50% and the other right. part is for the residents. And yeah, and then, then there's no then there's no disagreement. Here's your sign. Yep. Anybody else want to weigh in? It? We provide the signs, and the the rest will be the responsibility of the applicant. Does that give you enough direction to go on? Yeah, definitely. Great. Yep. Good Great. job. So we'll come up with a, a policy or standard operating procedure around that. Great. Thank Great. you. That's great. Um, just another point. We will be coming forward with uh, some mun municipal boundary review recommendations. We have to get that off to the UARB and soon so we will be uh coming forward with some i uh, might be a couple of areas of change for uh, 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 excuse me is the urb gonna hold a hearing here do you know they did last we haven't time, didn't they? we haven't made an application yet so oh, I, you have I to don't make know the application no. first, so, so we have to yeah. we're coming forward to council to give the recommendations of what we um mm -hmm. heard <clears throat> related on related to our public uh, review and we'll be bringing that back to council uh, just a couple of other things. Uh, so our financial statements need approval. They needed approval as of the end of September, um, but we're a bit behind on that. Uh, so we'll be having a meeting October 19th, um, a virtual meeting related to that. Uh, this, so I'm in a finance department here section related to some things here. Um, we will be having our next tax sale November 22nd at 11 a.m. I believe my report that I sent out said p.m. That'll be a late night. Um, so it'll be 11. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in our public works department. Uh, so the groundwork has been done, uh, Paul, for the second production line in Little Narrow. So we've gone forward with that. So it's, it's um, the groundwork is on its way or is there um, that will be going into production in the near future. Uh, Lester Tingley is going to be completing the survey for the White Point property. And we are also in the process of the environmental assessment uh, in that area. So all that's in the works. Um, meter reads for water readings are ongo ongoing for this quarter. So uh, people may be uh, seeing water utility people at different times. Uh, those readings are ongoing. Um, we did extend the post Fiona storm debris acceptance until October 15th. Uh, so that is closed as of last week. We also put a tender out for scrap metal recycling. Um, next week, or sorry, this week right now is waste reduction week. Um, and so we are going to be hanging some green lights outside the courthouse. Um, this has been requested by Divert Nova Scotia. So we will be having some green floodlights to promote waste reduction week. So everyone, please try to reduce your uh, environmental footprint. Um, and we will be putting out a snow a tender for snow removal for the north for our north facilities. In uh, senior safety, so senior safety has requested a change for the eligibility for the disaster financial assistance that the province had um, had announced uh, post tropical storm Fiona. Uh, there was a uh, something related to uh, receipts. If there was a, sorry, you no, know, it might've been an arborist, uh, an actual arborist that was needed or a landscaping company for the receipt to come from. I believe we've heard back that if it is a, a receipt, they will re accept that. It doesn't have to be from an arborist. If there's anybody who, um, were, any seniors who were, um, who were concerned with that, that piece of it and not putting in their receipts. So I 
encourage everyone to put in your financial assistance application for disaster relief. Um, she is also working on, a, on possibly putting together a vulnerable, vulnerable persons registry. We saw that this might be something uh, happening a little bit more based on um, the post-tropical storm that happened or the hurricane that happened um, and trying to find out the ins and outs of what this might involve in doing a vulnerable persons registry. Um, the RCMP and Cassandra will be doing a scams and frauds presentation at a few places around the county, uh, helping out with uh, seniors or making them more aware on scams and frauds. Um, she also attended a muffin session at St. James Presbyterian Church in District 5, and she said it was very well attended. Um, she has some concerns that the fare assistance program related to Victoria Transit, Victoria County Transit is not being used as well as we would like. Uh, so we have some administrative staff who have formed a subcommittee um, to try and get more usership out of this program and try to um, define what the application process is related to that, which is not really an application, but it, we're trying to make it more user friendly. Uh, she's also working with the library on a binder for seniors that will help them complete applications and helping them to actually fill out the applications for several different things that are available. Uh, she's working with our active living and recreation departments on doing a resource mapping database for seniors. Uh, she's also working with the food hub related to something that Fraser or uh, District or Councilor Patterson was talking about, uh, about the kitchen, I think the rental of the kitchen um, at the food hub to see if they can rent out the kitchen for a day a month for seniors for healthy meal preparation. Uh, and that could possibly be a New Horizons grant also, or it could be a combination of what we just saw the presentation on. A couple of things in tourism and recreation. So Dan's department, they visited several tourism providers on the North Shore for an introduction and to invite them to the bathroom meeting on October 27th. They're also compiling a trails users group and their contact information uh, to give updates on the multi-use trail update or trail development that we are working on. The, they did some travel along the Victoria County side of the trail this Saturday to take pictures uh, to help with the promotion of the 90th anniversary or to work towards the 100th anniversary of the Cabot Trail opening. He also attended a DMAH session on marketing levies, which is very close to what uh, Terry presented earlier. I also attended uh, this session where the province had rolled this out. Um, there are also some ongoing meetings and updates on DCB initiatives and opportunities to improve labor issues. And um, we also had a meeting earlier today, a housing meeting where we're trying to help with some of the labor issues that are happening around the county as well uh, in the recreation department. So they've been working on completing some disc golf research for some development of disc golf courses around the county. And so you'll hear more about that when anything exciting and new comes out related to it. They're working on a Victoria County recreation contact list. And they've been in contact with a few different schools within Victoria County to develop and implement some new program ideas for their students. And on the community development side, uh, the, as we heard earlier, the interest in Inganesh continues to be hot. So there are several uh, different uh, provincial, department, provincial and federal departments that are, um, have some keen interest and in working on some strategy work down there um, to keep things going, keep the momentum going down there. And they're also looking into some new programs um, from Nova Scotia CCTH's funding that was announced in the last, um, over the last week or so. And a couple of other things. Uh, at our last meeting, we talked about how we are having some trouble filling some positions and um, we, are thinking we need to start promoting how great of a place it is to work at the county. Uh, so staff, I think it was last November that we went out on a, I think we called them a road show, that we went out and visited the different municipalities. We're thinking possibly this year we're going to go out and do a bit of a job there. I think right now we have four, um, four positions, at least four positions that are listed on our website. 
And if nobody's looking at that, we feel we might be able to get some more um, candidates from uh, people coming and talking to us. And so we might go out and uh, have one North and one South uh, a job fair. And then we're also going to come up with a, an admin working group for next steps for uh, where the future of our administrative offices related to the courthouse and where our next, if it's not here, where our next home should be. So just a few things. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, we did get some information back related to the uh, disaster fund relief program for the $250 or $500, whatever the, um, the province was, was giving out. And as long as the person or business providing the tree removal service is able to provide an official receipt, we will accept the application. The receipt would need to contain the name of the company or person providing the tree removal service, the date the services were provided, and it has to be after September 23rd, 2022, the address where the services were provided, the individual who purchased the services, the cost of the services, and it says handwritten receipts are acceptable. <laughs> Open to just, all. Just a comment on that, Warden. I had a call from a resident who has uh, fairly large trees in his property at present. Uh, and if they were to fall, they would probably, well, they take out the power lines for sure. They're right next to the power lines. Probably affect two, if not three houses in, in the immediate vicinity. So th this is a person to me that is looking at preventative maintenance, right? Preparing for the next time. And I'm just wondering um, how that, would that qualify under that program you just mentioned, Dean? So the program just says tree removal reimbursement. Yeah. So it doesn't say if they're standing or not. Nope. No. So it might qualify. Then. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Name here also, there's a Jade Stuckley, if there are any questions. Could you email We'll that? send you that, that email. email Thank you, Fraser. It's a good point. We just received that information just within the last day or so. So, but I'll, I'll distribute it around. Any questions in regards to CAO's report this afternoon? Good. Thank you very much for your report. We're going to take a quick 10 minute break. We will reconvene in 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you.
Lai said it's not gone. Okay, welcome back to uh, Victoria County Council meeting for October 17th. We've gone through the agenda. We are down to district concerns. And we'll start with district number one, Councillor McNeil, please. Thank you, Warden. Uh, I have a couple of concerns uh, with uh, Nova Scotia Public Works or TIR issues. I, I keep on calling them TIR issues. Uh, I'd like a letter sent to TIR uh, concerning no break, uh, Jake break signs uh, on each end of the Wadmacook uh, First Nation. Complaints that uh, it's very loud at night. I was in touch with Steve McDonald on this issue and he gave, said that the policy right now is they won't put uh, these signs in an area that's uh, above 50 kilometers. So I wonder if uh, the letter could stay in this circumstance with the amount of population in the area. Could we have two signs on each end of the uh, reserve? Yeah. On on each side of the First Nation uh, reserve. That's a motion that the letter be. Second. Second. Conjury minded, the motion is carried and the letter will be sent. Also, uh, patching throughout the area. I don't know what's going on throughout our area. It doesn't seem like much road work is being done. Uh, there, at that uh, washout that was in Iona in the spring, they fixed it, uh, but it's subsiding again. And there's a hole there. On, on the turn and it's really dangerous. Cars are starting to go on the other side of the road. Again, I've contact uh, TIR a number of times on this issue. They haven't been, uh, nothing's been done. I uh, sent another email today, so hopefully something will be done this week about it. There's also patching has to be done throughout the area before the uh, asphalt plants are closed for the uh, winter. And I and, uh, contacted Steve uh, through email with that too. And one thing for council concern, uh, I'd like a letter to be sent to a group that's trying to buy uh, the land at Maskell's Harbor. Uh, actually, they're trying to buy it and donate it. Well, also not donate it, but have the province help with the purchase of the land to uh, be taken over by the province and uh, as part of the Barra Forest and McNeilsville Provincial Park. Uh, I sent a letter as councillor already uh, uh, in favor of this. All the land around that area is protected with the park area, so uh, it's only a small piece of land and uh, I'm just ignoring I'm in favor of that going towards the park. So it's, uh, you would like a letter in favor of yes. from council. So that is a motion from Councilor McNeil. Do we have a seconder for that, please? Councilor Longvall has seconded the motion. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. The motion is carried. The letter of support will be provided. Thank you. That it for you, That's Councilor. It. Deputy Warden Daphne. Uh, yes, thank you, Warden. Um, just uh, hearing some concerns once again with public works, uh, the highways in the in the area, uh, washouts on Smoky, they're only small right now, but continue to get bigger and uh, Beach Crossing Road, uh, we're hearing there's gonna be some work, but anyway, I'll be in touch with Steve McDonald to get an update on those ones, but uh, that's still, as usual, seems to be the biggest concerns. Uh, I, I did wanna make one mention, uh, Inganish and North of Smoky, I guess the whole Victoria County came together for the Hucklebuckle Festival uh, in Inganish on the weekend. Uh, amazing event. They estimate between 800 and 850 people attended the uh, pumpkin walk. Uh, roughly about 130 pumpkins from everybody, from everyone and their grandchild and grandson and grandfather, I guess, had a pumpkin done. So uh, amazing evening for it. The weather was great. Food trucks were lined up the lower um, Saturday. All the events well attended. Uh, lots of money was raised and uh, nothing but uh, uh, great comments from the, the whole festival. But uh, looking forward to next year already. And I know they're already starting to plan for next year, but I just want to send out a congratulations to all the volunteers. And there's too many to mention. I mean, there's everyone's involved in it, but uh, a great event. And uh, that's it for District 6. Thank you. Well done. And thank you. 
Councilor McLeod, anything from your district? Uh, yes, Warren. I ha uh, we have, a, as you say, the meeting for with NSHA and Thursday. Uh, Mr. McDonald from EHS came and gave us some a little more explain us how the, the organization works. So we I asked him if he could have come to council to just make a presentation to maybe start right now with how the organization works, uh, their staff and uh, and building relationship with them to have more conversations about how we can help them. So uh, we can ask to come to council, that would be great. Yeah, I would do that in the form of a letter of a motion. So oh, it's been okay. moved by Councilor McLeod. We have a second for that, please. Deputy Ward Daphne has seconded that, thank you. Uh, we have just Jennifer about the home support. So I would like if we can set up conversation in council about this, the new, the, what she's proposing, because I think it's very interesting. And just to put it clear, all of us. And the meals program, yeah. Okay, oh, thanks. And uh, yeah, so we can sit down with time and just to decide what we're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and the Bedeka Academy approach about uh, the for first time in too many many years they have a hockey team so they are asking for a for some support so I talked to Councilor Lopez and Warren Morrison if we can take um, for our district project the total of two thousand uh, dollars split in three so we'll to Bedeka Academy uh, with the concept of uh, hockey for the hockey. It, um, but that academic cover the cover high school, high school, school, yeah, and that's districts two, three, and four. Yeah, that's a motion. Do we have a second for that, please? I make a motion that second by Councillor Longbow. All in favor, contrary minded. The more the request was above thousand dollars, so that's why it's for the yeah, yeah, for the bedac two thousand, two thousand, yeah, it's between for the three academy districts and cover high. So, so there's some they're doing some teams there and um. And I have this, maybe well, with the committee report, but I just do it now. Um, we have a new good news from the federal government about the application we did with Victoria uh, County Transit. Uh, they uh, approve in principle our application for a new vehicle. So just to put in the minutes and, and thank you for the support for everybody. Uh, well done and uh, good job and uh, on the committee to secure the funding for that bus. So well done on your behalf as well as chair. Yeah, and uh, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Long, anything this evening? Uh, yes, I would. first I'd like to thank Steve McDonald and his crew for the work that they did on the Long Hill Road and also the Benbria Road and also the Big Harbor Road. They did some work, so I'm uh, thankful for that. Uh, the Tarbert Bale Road is still in a state of disrepair it's uh needs guardrails installed before the winter and the approaches to the bridge um need to be fixed as people are bottoming out going on and off the bridge um i'd also like to ask steve mcdonald when the lines will be painted on the road that was uh, chip sealed recently on the north shore because it's very uh black and hard to see um i'd like to ask that nova scotia power be called again in regard to the light i requested many months ago uh, when they're going to install it the one at uh, tarbot vale uh, steph has already called on it once she she's aware of the light and they said they were going to be on it but they ha still haven't done it so and now it's at halloween it's going to go the out uh, the it's going to go back an hour so it'll be getting dark at like 4 30 on and he has children uh a bunch of girls walking on the road uh in the morning and in the evening from school um also i'd like to remind steve mcdonald about the old big harbor road sign that was requested two years ago and it still um has not been put there and i think it's gone through council and everything's been done except for um their part Yes, I have. I've sent him this. I've contacted him many times about that one, but um, I I will send these concerns to Steve, but I want to just have them in the minutes. And that's it for me. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. They're duly noted. Uh, Councillor Oregon. Uh, I was. Uh, I sent a request into Zena to send five hundred dollars out of my district bus budget to the Pinkalicious Cancer Fundraising in 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 English. Uh, as Deputy Warden said, I'd like to congratulate the volunteers and organization organizers of the Huckle Buckle Festival. The pumpkin walk was amazing. It, it was, and the fireworks. And it's growing every year. So congrats to them. And also I'd like to take $500 out of my budget for the Huckle Buckle Festival. I think that's sent to Ryan Costello. Oh, Inganish Development. So $500, please. Uh, the public works, uh, the road work was done in New Haven. Um, after the Fiona, but much more is needed to be done. Uh, we need so much rock and, from coastal erosion. And also I have been sending emails. I know this is not on their priority right now, but it is for White Point area for the no parking for the school bus. Um, tourists are parking there all the time and they uh, they feel the safety of their children getting off the bus. Sometimes the bus can't even get turned around. So if uh, I'll be sending another email off to Steve for that. And that's it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Patterson, anything from your district this evening? Uh, thank you, Warden. Just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, <clears throat> I think people sent around an uh, email earlier about having email problems. And I wrote back, everything was fine in Ross Ferry. You can't be living right. Uh, Councillor McNeil, if you're not getting road work, I'm getting it. You got it. So, uh, <laughs> a little bit at a time. Anyway, um, October 8th, we had a, a Celtic Colors live Celtic Colors concert, the first time in three years. Uh, it was right back where it was. It was incredible. We had over 350 people attend a concert in Bolivar School from all over North America and probably all over the world. Uh, I go out in the lobby and talk to people uh, at the intermission and just see where they're from and what they think of it and so on. <clears throat> we had local people, Buddy McDonald, who's of course a legend in Cape Breton. Uh, Jordan Musician from Sydney, who was not really a Celtic singer, but he fit in like a glove. And uh, as I mentioned to uh, the CAO earlier, a, a mother and four sons from Mabu Coal Mines, I believe they're from, Joanne McIntyre. Uh, Gaelic singers was just absolutely fantastic. So uh, any investment we make in Celtic Colors, I think, as Terry said, the dollars multiply by quite a factor. Uh, since I'm the last one, I want to make a notice of motion too. Uh, I've got it written down, so I'll give it to you when I'm finished. Um, I'd like to make a notice of motion that council undertake a more detailed analysis or post-mortem of the effects of Hurricane Fiona. Uh, determine what worked and what needs improvement. So I'd like to discuss that at the next meeting, how it would work, like Lyle would obviously be included, of course, in his report in our uh, last minutes. But I think we have to look at what, what did work, and I think a lot of things did work, but there were also things that probably need improvement. So I'd like to make that uh, a notice of motion for the next meeting. Ward? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, and just one other thing too. Sure. I, I forgot this, but I just wrote it down. Um, the uh, Ross Ferry Stewardship Society, which is the managing agent for the uh, Ross Ferry Marine Park, uh, is looking at the possibility of getting someone, you know, it, this is into the future. But right now, the land is owned by the Department of Natural Resources. And part of it is owned by Natural Resources, and part of it is owned by Public Works, the old highway or road down to the, the ferry and then the, the actual ferry was natural resources owns that they are the stewardship society is exploring the possibility of acquiring or taking over that land and one of the options might be that the municipality might engage in a land swap with the province and you know do what kind of but as a two-step thing, this is just way out in the future, but I just want to kind of put it out there now because there are discussions taking place. Uh, MLB, MLA Bain is aware of uh, what this process might, 
might unfold as or whatever. So again, I just want to put it out so we have it in the minutes and that, uh, you know, we can think about how it may work if we do it in the future. Thank you. And I, there's no motion to make a notice of motion, right? I just table that and- Yes, we'll, we'll exactly. It and it'll be a motion at the yeah. next meeting. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, uh, district number three, I don't have any motions tonight. It uh, was already made. I was going to make a motion about EHS coming, but Councillor McLeod has looked after that. And I just want to just very quickly just mention we had a uh, public meeting here um, a week ago Thursday with the community, with the District Health Authority. And uh, I just want to thank the residents that came out. I want to thank the uh, representatives from the District Health Authority. Uh, they came, they presented well. It was a good open dialogue with the community. Uh, lots of concerns were addressed and lots of concerns remain. Um, we were uh, also in attendance for their local MLA and also the Minister of Health. So we want to acknowledge they were there as well. That meeting was followed up by a meeting that we had scheduled previously and was canceled because of the hurricane with the District Health Authority folks um, last Thursday. And there are some minutes from those meetings. So I would encourage anybody that wants to know what the conversation was about. Uh, it uh, dealt with not only the Victoria County Memorial Hospital here in Bedeck, but Buchanan um, Memorial down in Neils Harbor. So it was a it wasn't, uh, although the meeting was held here, it, it contained information and concerns that councillors and the public had about both sites. So with that, we just want to acknowledge uh, those folks that did participate. And as Councillor McLeod has made reference to, we have asked EHS to also come to, uh, to a council meeting because that is a, a separate issue, separate of DHA, although they're connected at the hip, um, it's it's a different organization and uh, there's different questions and different information that I think we still need to find out how they operate and what the current status of ambulatory care is in Victoria County. So I just wanted to bring that up and uh, I don't have anything other than that. Just a quick report from that, attending those meetings. And I should also thank the counselors that uh, attended the meeting in Bedeck as well. So, and understanding the ones from North wouldn't have the same interest that we would have. So uh, with the five that were in attendance, appreciate that. And thank you and the community, thanks you for attending as well. So with that, the next item is, are there any motions tonight other than the one? Yes, sir. Thank you, Warden. Um, earlier today, we held a housing committee meeting. Uh, just uh, there were some recommendations made. Uh, basically, uh, Destination Cape Breton presented a proposal to work with the municipality to uh, start working on some housing uh, within Victoria County. Uh, mainly at this point, uh, one section is land and English that they're interested in. And there was a recommendation made by uh, the committee at that time uh, that land be uh, provided uh, to Destination Cape Breton to initiate uh, a, a housing project in, in that area. So I'd like to make a motion that uh, we accept the recommendation of the housing committee uh, from this morning. I have a second for that motion, please. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. Contrary minded, motion is carried. Thank, Thank you. you. And I was remiss in that report about the, uh, here in the village that there was uh, uh, physicians were also uh, representative was there at the public meetings as well, spoke very well to the issues. And let us not forget that if it wasn't for the work of those nurses and doctors and the support staff at both those locations, particularly the one in Bedeck because of the pressure they're under from um, the traffic that's going through, we have to certainly recognize. And I think we should send them out a, a letter to the, uh, to the hospital so it captures uh, all the staff that are there, just doctors and nurses, the labs, just uh, indicating that we as a municipality recognize that they maintain that facility while it was under pressure and that uh, we appreciate the, uh, the um, amount of work that was required both on a personal and a professional basis during a very difficult time and it's still an issue. So I'd make that a motion if I could, Deputy Lord. Seconder for that motion. Second by Councillor McLeod. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary minded. Motion Thank you. Passed. Sorry about that. My apologies. I had it written down at the top of my list and I overlooked it. Did you have something you wanted to add, uh, Councillor Patrick? No, I just wanted it. Uh, so just 
just the, the night that they were the, uh, that they met with us on Thursday had only been open two days. So just what feedback we received from them. Haven't heard any specifically, but maybe we can send a, ask maybe when the representatives to provide a report, we'll ask the local uh, site manager, Chrissy Hines to provide her an update. So she can do that in writing or to us and maybe we'll request that. It's a good point. Thank you, Councillor. Is your mic on? I wonder, is it possible to get a representative from uh, Bell to come to council uh, to meet with us? Uh, well, especially what happened with, uh, uh, with Fiona. Sure, we can ask. And uh, yeah. also with the projects that are going on for broadband throughout and uh, Sure, we, you make it a motion, we well, can send the letter. So. Motion that we try to find a representative from Bell. I, the last person that was here was probably 10 years ago when David Hashem was here. So, Councilor, yeah, so with that, we could probably yeah. tell the end to call. Yeah. So, yeah. I believe I just got a contact information. So, uh, we'll see what we can do, and that could be part of whatever post mortem Fiona yeah. Um, yeah. meeting that we have. Great, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. So that was moved and seconded. All in favor? All right, Andy, uh, that's it for motions. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Yes, Councilor. I'd just like to add, as Fraser said about Celtic Colors and how great it is, I did go to four of the um, after hour club um, as I always volunteer there every year and the talent and it was just wonderful uh, it wasn't as busy at the after hours as other years because of Fiona and a lot of people got scared that we blew away or something but the talent and the amount of volunteers and people that put it on I think they all need to be congratulated because it brings such a big economic uh, spin to, to all of us in accommodation and restaurants and the in in the artisan shops and all of the islands. So I think it's a very worthwhile investment. Maybe make a motion to send a letter to Kevin Collins congratulating them on another successful okay. especially in light of the I'll make that motion to send a letter to the um, organizers of Celtic Colors, uh, congratulating them on the job well done again. Great. Do you have a second for that please? Second by Jackie. I just oh, want to Councilor. add that um, as I'm working right now, you can see uh, because we sponsor the, the, the shuttle, right? So yeah. they take it. They're very happy about that. The people very enjoy and feel it's a good investment. It's just good. It's good to hear. It's good to get positive yeah. feedback. So no, sorry. Anything else? Great. Thank you for those comments. So it's moved by Councillor Long, the second by Councillor. Oregon, all in favor? Aye. Contrary minded, motion's carried, and we'll send the correspondence to Celtic Colors. Any correspondence tonight? Uh, no, all correspondence has been uh, sent on your behalf, and any correspondence we've received, I have forwarded on. Okay, we didn't add anything to the agenda. The next meeting is scheduled for November. I'm sorry, Councilor McNeil. Just one thing regarding the next meeting. Uh, uh, I, I asked that a meeting could be held in a moment prior because it was so busy at the Hollywood Village over there. Someone called, they asked if it could be delayed till November. So if the next meeting or maybe the meeting after, we could contact Rodney and we have a meeting at the Hollywood Village. Yep, okay. keep either uh, or. I don't know if your mic was on there, Paul. Uh, it's on. It was. Is it? Okay. Okay. Okay, and we'll, we'll check. Uh, so uh, next month, November 7th, Deputy Warden will be in charge. I will be in Calgary, Alberta. So this is family. Might be a shorter meeting for sure. So. Um, that's the date of our next meeting. Was there any questions from anybody that joined us online? Uh, just let me just check. And no, no questions online. No questions. So we have a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor McMahon to adjourn. We are adjourned. Thank you.